Um, thank you all for coming today. Uh, it's really been um, a wonderful day. And um, I'll introduce myself before I introduce Alex Rivera. My name is Rebecca Schreiber. I'm an associate professor of American studies at UNM. And um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, filmmaker Alex Rivera to you today. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank him for taking time out of his very, very busy schedule um, to come and give a presentation today as part of the Symposium on Digital Latin America. Uh, as a way to introduce Alex Rivera, I'd like to say a few words about his work. Over the last 20 years, Alex Rivera has produced numerous films which, as he argues, eliminate two massive and parallel realities, the globalization of information through the internet and the globalization of families and communities through mass migration. These films include Why Cyber Saros from 1997, The Sixth Section from 2003, and Sleep Dealer from 2008. Sleep Dealer won multiple awards at the Sundance Film Festival and at the Berlin International Film Festival, and was screened as part of the New Director's New Film Series at the Museum of Modern Art and Lincoln Center in New York. In addition, Alex Rivera has been a Sundance Fellow, a Rockefeller Fellow, a USA Artist Fellow, and a Creative Capital grantee. Over the last few years, he's directed music videos for Allo Black and La Santa Cecilia as part of a collaboration with the National Day Labor Organizing Network on the Not One More campaign. Today, his presentation will focus on the subject of the globalization of information and communities. Please join me in welcoming Alex Rivera. Hey, everybody. Hello. Como estamos? It's, uh, I, I landed about 15 minutes ago, um, so I'm, I'm, my head is spinning. Um, it's a, it's, it's a delight to be here. I was recently here in New Mexico and Albuquerque. Every time I, I come here, I'm always a little bit disheartened to be speaking. I'd much rather be, be listening and learning. I'm always so inspired by, uh, by the culture here, the landscape, the architecture. Actually, I, I love being in Albuquerque, so it's good to be back. Um, uh, but I do apologize because I haven't been able to be part of the symposium. I had other commitments until literally 10 a.m. this morning um, in L.A. And other commitments that involved me wearing this jacket, so I'm going to take that off. <laughs> I, was, I, was, uh, I was the chair of a conference in, in Los Angeles this weekend, and so just, uh, just, just dropping in now. But um, anyways, I apologize because I know you've been involved in a lot of conversations, and I might repeat things, I might contradict things, I might... Um, I might not be in tune with the whole um, symposium so far, so. Uh, but anyways, I'd like to say thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Um, so I've been thinking about, you know, I, I've been working on a presentation, really looking at, 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 um, at my, my work and trying to sort of uh, share with, with you guys a little bit the thinking um, behind my work and specifically at the intersections uh, that the symposium references digital and Latin America. Um, so just been thinking about those two, why those two might go together, what do we see when they do. Um, simple definitions, of course, the digital comes from the word digitus, right, the Latin for the finger. <laughs> um, Latin America, the Americas south of the United States. The conference, you know, maybe could be about fingers south of the border, but it's probably not. <laughs> um, <laughs> Here's my, here's my digital. Um, it, it could also be, um, and as you're more accurately looking at the catalog, it looks like it's an exploration of digital culture and digital art in Latin America, and that's definitely more interesting than, than the fingers. However, to me, the most interesting way to reflect on the concept, the concepts, the kind of geographies implied by the words digital and Latin America is to search for ways that the two notions might illuminate each other, ways of seeing through the two ideas. My point of entry into this reflection is as the son of a cross-border migrant. My father came to the United States from Peru when he was in his early 20s, and I'm part of a family that is continuing to cross borders and kind of connect um, Latin America with the United States through our family, through the movement of our family. And that's where my first film began. Uh, my first film, which was completed in 1995, 
tried to depict elements of my dad's uh, life story. Um, when I made the decision as a college student to make a film about my dad, I started to observe him like a documentarian would. And I saw that one thing that my dad does a lot, right, back then especially, was watch TV. Uh, watch Univision in particular, Spanish language TV. And um, I started to think about that because we were in upstate New York. That's where I grew up in upstate New York. And back then there weren't a lot of Spanish speakers in that part of the country. Um, my dad, of course, grew up speaking Spanish, grew up in a, in a, in a very tough neighborhood in, in Lima, Peru, and he left that behind. And um, so when I started to look at my dad and try to look at him with a sort of open mind and see, well, why, why might he be, um, it's gonna, okay, I'll explain this image, but why, why might he be watching six hours, eight hours of Spanish language television every night? I started to kind of conceive of it as a, a type of a method or a way of um, reverse migrating, right? Of, of reconciling a past, his Spanish language past, his Latin American past, and his American and very English language present. So physically being in the US, but mentally, um, in terms of memories and other longings, kind of wanting to go, go back and using media, using technology, in, in that case, the technology, the old technology, the television, to um, mitigate uh, these two realities and almost live in a third space. And so <clears throat> the film I made ultimately has other things in it as well. It has one of the main characters is my father, who you see there, my papa. The other main character is the potato, the papa. Um, <laughs> and so the, the film is called Papa Papa. And, you know, and it tells the story of these two bodies, these two beings, one vegetable, the potato, one uh, human, my father, uh, both of Peruvian origins. The potato, of course, is first cultivated by the Inca Indians in the Andes. Um, and then the potato, the film tells the story of how the potato ends up in the United States, becomes the French fry, the, the Pringles, and then tells the story of my dad's journey coming to the United States and ending up a, a kind of Peruvian couch potato. Right. And, uh, anyways, so in, in any case, the, the, but the main, the, the, this, what I'm going to show is just a little clip from the film, uh, from the ending of the film, in which um, my dad gets, I, I, I wanted to kind of depict this third space. As I was saying, he's not physically in Peru, he's physically in the US, but he's not experientially or fully here either, right? There's a, a, a very powerful connection to that place left behind and the role of technology in terms of allowing someone to kind of live in that, in that third space. And so, um, so here, we'll watch the clip. Yeah. Yeah. 
to American reality. So I had, a, a, as I was mentioning, so the film started off as this kind of contemplation of my dad's journey in parallel with the potato. These two beings ending up kind of virtualized in America, the potato becoming the, the Pringles and other kind of food products, and my dad becoming immersed in the, the visual culture of the TV and uh, using that Spanish language TV to kind of live in a third space. And then, but as a filmmaker, it's always about working visually. And so how do you depict that third space? And this is 1994. The internet at that moment was just basically coming online. It was very, very early. But there was all of this rhetoric, um, new rhetoric, new digital imaginaries. And one of them was this concept of virtual reality. And I said, that's, that's it. That's the way to describe the sense of being present, um, but also being somewhere else at the same time. That's the third space. It's a way to visualize the third space. And so this is kind of the beginning of my journey in terms of trying to see ways in which the Latino condition the Latin American reality, especially in terms of how it's connected to the American reality, is uniquely um, capable of being depicted through digital metaphors, right? That, that, that this connectivity between North and South, between the dynamics of immigration, which I'll explore a little bit, really avail themselves to metaphors and to being read through the digital vocabulary. Um, so, just a couple, a couple thoughts. One, in terms of looking at immigration, to me, I, I've started to see immigration through, uh, in, in Papa Papa, I started to see it as obviously not just people that migrate, but products that migrate, information that migrates, that there's all of these flows that connect north and south. Uh, I like to divide the, these flows into um, kind of two, two ways of seeing these flows. One is uh, the informational. Uh, this is a map of the internet, right? So uh, all of us can kind of relate to the mig migrations of information. Right? All of us have relationships with people we don't see. All of us buy things from places we don't. Um, I mean, use the internet to, 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 to make purchases in remote places. So we, we're familiar with information flowing kind of across distances and across borders. Um, this is another map of the internet from the Apple operating system. Um, it's interesting to me how much this image of the internet mirrors uh, the other massive flow, right? So flow number one is informational, flow number two is physical. This is a map of the shipping routes. And so um, this is the kind of physical internet, if you will. This is how the products that we're wearing, if you take off our shirts and look at the labels, if you look at your bags, your, 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 your cell phones, almost everything we touch has come from some other point on the globe. And the way that those products make it to us is over the oceans, through this map of, um, through this system, an extraordinary network of trade, which happens over the oceans. Um, the big, to, to enable the system of physical trade, right? Uh, the innovation is the, um, the ship was a shipping container. Okay? Um, before these boxes were invented, global trade was very expensive. Uh, you had to load and unload boxes. Um, there, was there was pilfering, people would steal. Uh, it was labor intensive. Uh, these boxes are what allow the global economy to occur. Um, in digital culture, in terms of the informational flows, uh, we talk about packets. Packets are what get beamed around. So when you send e an email to somebody, who's in New York, the, those little bits of information are traveling through, um, through the network from server to server over the, the fiber in, in units called packets. But in the physical network, we're looking at shipping containers. These are what allow uh, globalization to happen. Um, this is footage I shot in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, it's an area known as Container City, uh, where the containers are piling up. Um, What's happened, the kind of side effect of, of globalization is that um, the idea was that containers would come and go and we'd, we'd make something in the US that people in Mexico would need and they'd make something and, that we would need and go back and forth or to China that these boxes would go back and forth. But what's occurred, of course, is that we don't really manufacture anything here and so the boxes arrive 
to, uh, in this case, New Jersey, to Long Beach, to uh, Seattle, and then they never get sent out again. Um, and so they're piling up in these, these massive um, cities of empty containers. So this is a very quick and dirty image I made just to talk about how highly networked our reality is. And just so you see the shipping routes and, uh, and the, kind of the abstract representation of the internet together. So, uh, you know, so, so, so we live in terms of the information we consume and in terms of the products we touch in a world where there really are very, very few borders. Right? The, and, but as, that, as those two systems, the digital system and the physical system, have been constructed, right, this unprecedented uh, time together of the world, uh, what I would call a kind of bending of space around the globe, erasing borders in almost every sense, the only barriers that have been made more material and more in, enforced are the ones that affect the most vulnerable um, transnational population. I know something's wrong with this video, but it's very moody. Um, yeah, it, but this is footage I shot at the uh, U.S.-Mexico border where it runs out into the Pacific Ocean. Um, I'm hoping, let's see here. Okay, well, let's see, this one looks like it's playing better. Um, and this is a video I shot three, three minutes or so at the same site. So this is a U.S.-Mexico border running out into the Pacific Ocean. And so, so Latinos in particular, right, I think this is a contradiction that is global, it's a, it's a situation that is global, but I do think uh, between the United States and Mexico, the United States and Latin America, and for Latino people in general, this is a contradiction which is very heightened. It's very extreme in our families and in our communities and in our lived experiences. It's, we live in a world where, where products uh, travel around the world, it's called free trade, where images uh, and capital flow around these robust digital networks all around the world, but where we're not supposed to, right? Our families are not supposed to move. It's a contradiction. just to make this video understandable. We need to, it's a, it, we'll see an image that was captured at the uh, U.S.-Mexico border. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, and so I mean, the the image um, is a is a documentary image from about uh, about probably twelve years ago now. And it, to me, it still looks like a kind of haunting science fictional image, but it's it's archival. It's from a, a while ago. Um, looking at the image, I don't know if folks could see uh, the product all around uh, the people. All the products are bananas. Um, the way this type of imaging works, it tunes into the density. Um, and so if they had it tuned for human flesh, it will also detect the rubber of the tires, the rubber tubes in the engine block, um, and the bananas, of course. And so, um, you know, when I first saw the image, it, it haunted me, uh, just on an emotional level, just looking at it, it was just uh, disturbing, right? But, um, but thinking about it in terms of what I was saying a moment ago, in terms of these flows that, that cross borders, the, it's a kind of perfect representation of what what is, is happening in the sense that you can see here that what was intended to cross were, was the banana, were the bananas, right? That was intended to come, and then the people are hiding there, trying to have the same freedom as the as the product, right? And the vessel uh, which it all travels in is the shipping container, right? The unit that the migrants know that the shipping containers are s cruising around the world unregulated, uh, freely, welcomed, uh, etc. And uh, so people aspiring to have the same, the same freedom as the product. Um, just to add one more layer to that, I guess, is to think about the banana in terms of what's in it. Of course, it's a, it's, I don't know, it's a fruit or a vegetable. It's probably fruit. It's a fruit. Uh, but inside there, inside there, to get those bananas in, there's all this labor, right? There's all of this, what, we, what, what I like to think of as dead labor. Um, so it's energy, human energy is inside of all of those bananas in the truck behind it that might be filled with television sets. There's hundreds and thousands of hours of human labor in the truck behind it where it's carrying clothing, more labor, right? So that there is a, a kind of um, well, what we might call dead labor embedded in these products that are in these trucks and that are meant to cross. But the living labor, a person who's alive, who might speak a language, who might want to go to school, who might want uh, health care, etc., living labor is, of course, criminalized and um, needs to hide in order to, to cross. Um, inside these images, I see a kind of desire, right, on the part of, of power, in this case, a desire to, to patrol, um, to have total control over presence and absence, a desire to have the work, right, embedded in those products, all the labor that comes. We want the work, but the workers, the people, stay out, right? Um, here's a film I did. Um, also, now we're kind of skipping around in time and space and trying to, you know, so the, the one we saw recently, just a moment ago, of the x-rays, that's more recent work. This piece I'll show right now is before it. Um, but in any case, this is a film kind of about that impossible desire, the desire to have the work without the workers. It's a kind of political satire piece I did. It's about five minutes long from 1997. It's known as the Cybercero Program. In the earlier half of the 20th century, the U.S. solved its farm labor problems through a program known as the Bracero Program. Bracero, in Spanish, means a man who works with his arms and hands. Under the Bracero Program, Mexican workers who were not involved in their own country's economy would be invited to participate in the American economy as farmhands. Government buses and trains transported braceros from the Mexican border to American farmlands, 
Unfortunately, while solving America's farm labor problems, the Bracero program contributed to several other problems. Some Mexican workers would run away from their jobs and stay illegally in the United States. Others would cross the border illegally and then blend in with the Bracero workforce. No matter how they arrived here, the presence of Braceros contributed to a climate of racial and economic suspicion. Evidence of major tension was not hard to find. So it, 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 again, so it's a, it, um, this is made. That was made in 1997. You can see the Commodore 64 computer for people who are around then might remember those machines. The joystick, um, <clears throat> but it was by by contemplating again that that state of um, living in a society where I could see in my own cousins who continue to arrive uh, to this day, who many of whom arrive undocumented to this country. Uh, the state of being where they're, they're physically here, their work is needed and wanted and, and is made present, but their being as, a, as an entire human being is, is not, not yet uh, welcome. And uh, so that, that, so again, I'm running these kind of observations about what I would call aspects of the Latino condition, aspects of the um, transnational Latino condition through a kind of set of digital filters, digital metaphors, to try to create images that help us understand, uh, understand them. Um, in terms of that particular project, the next iteration of it after the short film we just saw was a website. I put this website up, which like the film, kind of takes the rhetoric of a, a corporate site. Um, and so, you know, it, it talks about our business model for doing this and, uh, you know, you can, see the CEO and our staff. And so this is kind of a, a hoax website um, for a business uh, that's doing the CyberSero model. Um, this website sat there for a couple years, and then in 2003, I got a phone call from a, a journalist at a newspaper called La Opinion, which is, you know, it's the largest Spanish language newspaper in the country. It's based out of Los Angeles. And he said, you know, I'm on a very tight deadline 
um, and I'm writing, uh, I want to write about your company. Um, can you, can, can you uh, give me an interview with the CEO? And um, so I ended up um, doing the interview, you know, and then they, they ran this article, which I don't know if you can read it, but it says, you know, Sagrasero Telepresencia de Campesinos, so telepresence for farm workers. And then below it says, Trabajan en un prototipo robótico para reemplazar a los inmigrantes en la industria agrícola en los Estados Unidos. El proyecto causa escepticismo. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but they, they interviewed uh, the United Farm Workers, they interviewed the chief economist of the state of California, um, all about this impending um, jobs program which was going to replace farm workers with remote controlled robots. And it was funny and bizarre, but also I think what had happened, right? Because the idea first occurred to me in the short film in 1997, the website went up around 2000, and then this journalist called in 2003, is that the world was catching up with this strange satire. Uh, around the year 2001, 2002, I started to get on the phone and speak to people that I knew were in India, right? For the first time in the 90s, calling to India was super expensive. It would make no sense to, uh, but, around 2002-2003 the call center architecture started to be built and now we all are very familiar with the dynamic of picking up the phone and having a work relationship a labor relationship a service relationship with someone who's never who's not anywhere near us and in real time and so i think the world was kind of catching up with this satire and again i think one of the things i'm trying to say in this talk is that I think that the Latino condition, in terms of the transnational part of it, it's not a coincidence that, that this mass migration that we've been living through is occurring simultaneous to this mass migration of information. That these, um, that these mirror images, right, that I'm trying to understand the condition of being a worker who is undocumented leads me to think about robotics and the way in which the internet lets us visualize alienation. Right? And then it actually starts to happen, right? And so these kind of, um, I feel like I'm trapped in a funhouse mirror where I see something happening in reality, make a metaphor about it to describe it, and then it starts to occur around us. And to me that points to something that is, there's something underneath these dynamics which unites them. And maybe, maybe we'll be able to get at that a little later in the talk. Um, so anyways, this, this project, I ended up, um, kind of falling in love with this image of the, the remote worker and the next iteration after the website where they started to write a screenplay to do a science fiction film uh, set in a world where the border is sealed but the network is open. And so here's an excerpt from that film. The film was called Sleep Dealer, uh, which you can see right there. Um, and uh, and I, I like this phrase, undead labor, right? The idea that if we can, in traditional economics, uh, a product is dead labor and a, and a worker is living labor, but these kinds of remote exchanges, which are imagined in my film, but which we also live with now every day, like I mentioned, I kind of, I like to think of it as a sort of hybrid form, it's an undead labor. But anyways, here's a scene from the movie. It's very, very dark on the screen. I hope it doesn't, I don't know why it's so dark, but imagine with your eyes brighter. This is the factory in Mexico, I guess. Este es el sueño americano. Le damos a los Estados Unidos lo que siempre han querido. Todo el trabajo sin los trabajadores. José está en un matadero en Iowa y María es niñera de una niñera de Washington. Sí. Ustedes tres van a estar en una chapota en Santiago. Muchacho, enchúfate. Tu futuro empieza hoy.
think the, the whole film is playing, uh, you know, sometime soon, like June 20... June 26th June. the National Hispanic Cultural Center. So June 26th at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. Um, but so, um, by, by trying to visualize this, this idea of uh, the state of being and, and, and non-being, right, simultaneously, I ended up essentially creating an image of a drone. Right, in the silly five minute film we watched with the orange picker, it's essentially a drone, what we call today a drone, a, a, a machine that is controlled remotely. Um, and again, that image occurred to me in 1997, now many, many years before the drones, these kinds started to appear. Um, and then of course, these kinds of drones start to appear on the US-Mexico border. There's a, the story of how the drones appear on the U.S.-Mexico border is, a, is an odd one. Um, maybe people remember a group called the Minutemen, a vigilante organization, mostly in Arizona, but in different parts of the country. Uh, before the Minutemen, the same, the same men had a group called the American Border Patrol. And um, they were watching the TV news and seeing the drones being used in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they said, we need that technology here to stop the invasion here at home. And uh, so, what, but there were no drones on the border back then, right? And so what they did was they bought a, a, an airplane, a remote control airplane. They labeled it the Border Hawk. That's what they, the name they gave it. And they flew it over the U.S.-Mexico border. And they said, you know, we have better technology than the government. And then, of course, CNN shows up, Fox shows up, NBC shows up, and puts them on TV. And really, they, they, they're saying, you know, the government's spending all their money on war technology. The war is here on the border. Why aren't these machines here? And these guys were successful, really, at, at shaming the government into buying, uh, starting to spend $15 million a pop on these uh, the Predator and Reaper drones to fly um, 24 hours a day now over different sectors of the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, but it started with these guys as kind of almost comedians with, an air, with a toy airplane. Um, so in any case, in 2005, uh, I, I was um, invited to do a project on the U.S.-Mexico border with, uh, with, my, with my friend and collaborator, and we decided to, to, to add another drone to the border. And, but this one would not be about surveilling people, about hunting people, but would be about uh, hopping the border, about um, erasing the border. And so we, we built this machine that we call the low drone. Um, it's, um, it's got a much better paint job than their drones. Um, you know, whereas their drones are painted gray to reflect radar, to be as invisible as possible. Ours is painted gold and with candy colored props and chrome, and so it's highly visible. Um, while theirs flies up high to not be seen, ours flies low. Um, and they launched from the US, we launched from Mexico. And um, the hot bear is flying, flying over, the, over the border. Here's a picture of it in, in action. <laughs> yeah. it's, you can't see his face, you know, but it, I can still see he's, he, he's, he's jealous of our paint job. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but they're, you know, um, it, CNN and Fox and it didn't show up to report on our drone for some reason. They, they had, but, um, but anyways, this is just one, the, the drone, of course, is just one of almost countless examples. Uh, earlier, when we saw the image of the people in the truck, right, that's uh, what we call backscatter imaging. Now, people probably know um, when you have people gone to the airports and done this lately, you know, if you do this in an airport, you're getting that kind of an image made of you. Um, again, like I mentioned, that image was taken at the border yeah, about maybe 12 years ago now. So that technology that now is in the airports maybe as of a year ago, two years ago, was on the U.S.-Mexico border 12 years ago. Uh, the drones are on the, you know, first on the border, but now we're starting to hear about police departments using them. And so the border has become a kind of zone of digital experimentation where new technologies of surveillance are experimented first 
on immigrant bodies in this kind of non-legal zone of the, of the borderlands, and then later brought into the interior of the country. Right? So, um, <clears throat> so anyways, I, I, I hope I sort of laid out a little bit this, what I call a kind of a contradiction, a conundrum, the, this, this apparatus, the border as a kind of filter that allows through it products, capital, uh, information, images, uh, wealthy individuals who have passports can travel through this wall like they're David Copperfield, but this this structure is really only intended to hit one target, and that is the that is the, the person who needs to cross out of hunger, out of desire to work, um, out of desire to be reunited with their families. So how you know so how how can we think out of, out of this trap, or how can the uh, we can imagine a different type of network, imagine a different type of connectivity. And uh, so this is a clip from a, a documentary I made, which um, is, is about exactly that. Um, these are all uh, gentlemen from a small village in southern Mexico who've ended up one after another, uh, like bits of data, like shipping containers following a route. These, these guys started in a village in southern Mexico and one after another ended up in a, in a village in upstate New York. Um, and so in upstate New York, they start to organize. And um, it's just a few minutes, this clip. It's actually two clips sandwiched together. <laughs> Yo trabajé en una factoría. A mí, a mí me agarró mi nación y me mandó para México. Entonces yo me di cuenta cómo es la vida allá. Una pequeña cooperación de que 
puede dar 20, 10, 5 pesos. Había unas personas pues, que, que nos tomaban a loco. ¿no? ¿Ustedes cuándo van a terminar eso? Decían, ¿cuándo van a terminar eso? Que es mucho dinero. Cuiden su dinero y dejen eso porque eso nunca se va a perder. En México ganas como 400 pesos, que aquí son como 50 dólares por semana. Nunca se haría que estar estando allá. No, no se hace una tal vez. De aquí lo fuerte es el dólar. And so, uh, through the course of the film, um, they, uh, this, this group, this organization in upstate New York, uh, they build this baseball stadium, they, they buy an ambulance in, in New York and send it back. They're, they're in the process of raising $100,000 to build a, a water system in their village. And, um, and it might be a stretch, maybe, uh, to call it a net, but I don't, I don't think it is. It, it's, a, it's a human network, right, that connects two places, a, a village in Mexico, a village in upstate New York. It's tied together and activated by a technological network. The money that they raise in New York is sent back by money wiring services. You see the uh, transmission of video, which is the only thing that lets them perceive and witness uh, the work that's being done um, where, they're, where they're not present. And, um, and uh, so, and it's a telephone that allows them to administer it. So there's all these technologies uh, of, of the network that allow this kind of human network to transnationalize itself and find some power, leveraging currencies one against another. Um, and so it, it's a kind of alternate version of a lot of the, the dynamics that I've been describing in some of the other work. It's the opposite of an alienation, or it's a reverse disalienation, right? As, in as much as the undocumented is as a person who's here physically, but maybe not, not here politically, these guys are flipping that around to be here physically and there politically, to, to re-emerge or to find a kind of power by becoming transnational, like, like a corporation. So um, what I've been trying to get at, and I hope, it's, I hope there's something useful in here in terms of what you've been discussing and what you're thinking about in your own work and your own pursuits, is just this idea that that Latinos, Latin American people right now have a unique position to dive into and, and illuminate the digital realm. Um, we're, uh, we're a kind of human wiki. <laughs> we're a synthesis of many, we, Latino people are a, a, an invention of when many races and many cultures encounter each other, right? So we're a kind of a synthetic race, a race that was generated only recently. And to that, in, in that sense, we're, we have a kind of, uh, a home in, in the digital culture and the digital imagination, which is about these transmissions, duplications, texts that don't have authors. Um, we're non-being beings. Latinos are, have become the kind of icon in the United States of people who are physically present but legally absent. We embody, um, in some ways, new and strange alienations that all of us live through in, in the digital moment. And, um, and we're a human network. We, uh, as people who are profoundly connected through networks of migration across the Americas, Latinos profoundly embody a kind of digital state of being and a point, and I think our, our, our existence and, and the way that we, we live in, across borders points to an age in which borders might be reimagined in new and more humane ways, right? Maybe even deleted, you know? Um, so those, um, and so that, that kind of line of thinking to me has been really productive in my work. Um, and, um, and I hope some of it has resonated with you guys and I'm super happy to open the floor to comments, questions, doubts, and thoughts. Thank you. Okay.